Yo, this is the King Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys. And whenever I'm home, I listen to WLIR FM Garden City. You want to know why? Because all the other stations suck. LIR 92.7, the best new music first. Good morning, I'm Don and Don. I want to say hi to the wrestler in Bayshore. Hello, Zane and Elmont. And Jennifer and Elmont's got it turned up loud. This is new from the cars at WLIR. This is Tonight She Comes. Well, anyone who listens to this show knows that we have a great affection for WLIR. And producer Ellen Goldfarb is taking that affection one step further, because she's producing a documentary film about the station called Dare to be Different, the movie. Ellen joins us on That Modern Rock Show tonight. Ellen, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with uh, WLIR. I grew up on Long Island and uh, started listening to LIR probably in the late 70s, but really became a fan when it switched over to the station that Dare to be Different with the new music format. Right. So I became one of the obsessed listeners and um, really felt an identity with the station, felt a sense of community, and had a real passion for the music. It was nothing that I've ever heard and really just became addicted. I mean, I didn't want to not hear the station for, for a day because you never know, knew what you were going to miss. You know, there were new songs introduced all the time from all over the world, and it was almost like you were able to leave Long Island and go to um, England and go to Germany and go to all these other countries and get culture and get experience with all kinds of music without having to leave Long Island. I was a very big fan of the station and and the DJs. Right. You know, I think that's something that people across the country uh, don't realize maybe about the East Coast, that certainly in that time period of the uh, early 80s, LIR was as a part of our cultural landscape as, say, early MTV was. It was considered just as important and had the same influence, maybe even more so. I don't know if that translates to the rest of the country. I, I would suppose in California, K-Rock might have been their LIR. Right. I, I, at the time that we're talking about, which is, you know, very early 80s, um, the rest of the country was not really exposed to this music. And we were very fortunate in New York to have had WLIR because it gave us a whole other opportunity of music that nobody else had except for, like you said, K-Rock. But from what I'm learning through my research, um, K-Rock at that time was championing more Los Angeles bands. They were playing the European bands, but more so the the Los Angeles bands like Oingo Boingo and right. um, those type of bands, uh, Drama Rama, which we really play on LAR. But eventually they got wind of what we were doing over on the East Coast with LAR and these, these bands. And so they kind of became sister stations um, after a while. But um, at that time, those were the only two commercial stations. There were a couple in Boston. Uh, I shouldn't say there were a couple in Boston that were starting to do that, as well as com- um, college stations. So really, college stations came way before any of these other stations. Right. And, but what LAR did was, they brought it to a more commercial level so that more they were able to get more listeners and were able to connect more with the labels and and get it going to a different level than the college stations were able to do. The countdown is in progress. T minus 181 days until 1984. A reminder from WLIR Garden City, the station that counts. Count, count, count. We'll be featuring a brand new single from this band, Depeche Mode. This song, of course, when Vince Clark was still in the band. And a former screamer of the week. WLIR just can't get enough. What prompted the decision to actually make a movie? Was it a case of, I wish there was a documentary about <laughs> LIR, and there isn't one, so I'm going to have to be the one to make it? Was it that kind of thing? <laughs> Uh, well, sort of. Um, I really got inspired. Um, I'm in a whole family of um, entertainment um, people, from my brother, who's a big screenwriter, to my sister-in-law, who's an actress. And uh, Anyway, so um, I was on Facebook and noticing that there were quite a few tribute pages to WLAR. And I was so impressed and realized, wow, you know, this station was so important to so many people, including myself. 
And um, I know that for many people, they like to go back to that time. And so probably the Facebook pages were bringing that to them because I was recognizing all the posts from people just talking about that and how they miss LAR so much and how radio's not the same and how the music's not the same and the connection between DJ and fan is not the same. And I thought, exactly, wow, you know, we should be doing a movie about this. And I started to do research, and um, I pitched this to CAA, who my brother is with. And right. we, we were originally going to go with this as a, a theatrical fictional film. And right. when we spoke to CAA, they suggested, you know, this would make a really good documentary. I got in touch with Bob Wilson, who was running the Facebook page. Um, and the WLIR website, and he had a lot of good resources on his page, and I thought, hmm, I really should get in touch with him. But I knew deep down in my heart the person that I needed to get in touch with was Dennis McNamara, who was the program director at that time, and I remembered that. And these names just never leave you. So I did my research and searching, and, and also with the help of Bob Wilson, was able to get in touch with Dennis, and this was about three years ago, and we've been working together ever since on the film. The way it's going right now, this film is going to be super successful. And not only for New Yorkers, but people across the country. Because I'm living in L.A. now, and I share what we've done so far, and I've shown people my sizzle reel. And they're like, wow, we grew up in L.A., and we want to see this movie. And so there you go. There's a good common interest about it because it's about the music and for what LAR did for, for this country. That's something I should stress to the audience that in case they get the wrong impression. This movie is not finished yet and it's not out yes. there yet, so we're talking to you while you're in the process of putting this documentary together. Can you tell us about some of the musicians that you've interviewed and that will appear in the film? Absolutely, sure. So yes, we are still in production. Um, so far, we've interviewed um, Fred Schneider from the B-52s. Okay. Uh, Dave Wakeling from the English Beat, Kurt Smith of Tears for Fears, uh, Midger of Ultravox, who's a fascinating man, um, Annabella Lewin of Bow Wow, well. mm -hmm. uh, Howard Jones. We interviewed APB, mm -hmm. which was a staple WLIR band. Sure. Um, and they played two years ago on Long Island at a WLIR reunion um, where we did a lot of sh uh, shooting footage over there, but we interviewed them. We also interviewed Mickey Lee, who's a musician. He has his own band, but he's also um, Joey Ramone's brother. Right. So he was great. And Monty Melnick, who was the Ramone's road manager, we had a great interview with him. Okay. Chris France and Tina Weymouth, who were with the Talking Heads and the Tom Tom Club. Right. Um, we've interviewed Seymour Stein, who was a huge music executive um, for Sire Records. He was the owner of Sire Records and. He signed many, um, many of these artists from LIR directly onto Sire Records. So they had a very strong connection. Um, I've interviewed many of the DJs from the station. Elton Spitzer, who was the uh, station's owner at the time. Um, many music executives. Um, different people um, who were connected to the station um, in many different ways. Fans. Um, we just did a shoot recently, so I'm trying to recall all the people right. that we interviewed. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. And then other artists that we're planning on interviewing are um, Sting from The Police, Jit Care from Simple Minds, Marky and Tommy Ramone, Elvis Costello, who we've already spoken to, uh, Martin Fry of ABC, who we've already spoken to, mm -hmm. uh, Madonna, and some of the members of Jane's Addiction. And then... We also want to show how this music influenced current bands. So um, some of the current bands that we feel were influenced by 80s music are bands like The Killers, Interpol, Phoenix, Franz Ferdinand, No Doubt, Muse, and Lady Gaga. People that we're looking to interview are U2, um, The Cure, Duran Duran, Blondie, uh, Joan Jett, New Order, Depeche Mode, Adam Ant, Billy Idol, and XTC. Those are just some of the, the people. We're, we've got a list, but those are the top ones that we're still looking to interview right now. Hello, 
Hello, this is Vince. And this is Alison. From Yaz. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and you're listening to WLIR at, at 92.7. The, the station. station that dares to be different. Different. <laughs> different. <laughs> This particular documentary is about WLAR, the original WLAR from um, right before it changed over to the Dare to be Different years, when it was owned by Elton Spitzer, um, when it was going through all the issues it was going through with the FCC and their temporary license, and when the tower got knocked down and they lost their signal, and all of the little trials and tribulations that went on between 82 and 87 and how it was this little 3,000-watt station on Long Island competing with, you know, other super stations in Manhattan, and they were able to overcome a lot of this uh, adversity and introduce new music to America, new modern music or um, alternative music of the 80s to America. So that was their real pinnacle time. That was their heyday of those five years. And then, right, the station got sold to new owners and, Try to continue the magic. It kept it for a while, but it really didn't work the way it was when Elton Spitzer was the owner. And so that's the magic that we want to talk about those right. years. And in those years, you know, I was the right age for that entire experience. And uh, you lived on Long Island, so you had the benefit of probably getting a decent signal. For people in New Jersey who listened to LIR, and it was at the time a status symbol in school, you know, that you had to listen to LIR. Uh, just getting the station in was a feat in and of itself, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have some terrific stories that people have shared with us. There is a great story um, that was told by Dennis um, regarding Mick Jagger, <laughs> okay. who actually called Dennis at the station and said, and they were they were good friends at the time, and said, hey, man, you know, what, what the hell's going on at your station? I've got a radio in my shower, and I've got to sit and listen to it in my shower because that's the right. only place in my, my apartment I can get your, your damn signal or whatever. And it was a really funny story. So uh, for Mick Jagger to, <laughs> to say that, right. pretty funny. And, um, yeah, I mean, people were obsessed. They would go and develop these makeshift antennas. And, you know, in Manhattan and certain areas, it was really difficult to get the station. And, oh, yeah, they used rabbit ears. And whatever they can do, people would drive around. Oh, yeah. Certain- with their car and, and park and just listen because they didn't want to move their car. They didn't want to miss anything. Yep. I remember my friends and I would go up into <laughs> up into the hills, you know, on, yeah. a, on a Friday night and sit for two hours and, and listen. And, you know, some of my happiest memories are of those times. You know, I think that's the that's what resonates, I think, most about uh, LIR. You know, you associate them with really great times in your life Absolutely. at that time. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about how this how this documentary is is going to be presented. Obviously, you've got the interviews, which are you know you've obviously the standard thing, and you see the guy. It's a medium shot and everything. But I'm assuming that you've also got um, air checks of LIR. They're floating around all over the internet. Yeah, we've got tons of air checks because the DJs have them, Dennis has them, and other people that have been associated with the station have them. We have tons of photos. Thank goodness to fans and DJs and. So we, we have some footage. Um, I think our biggest challenge is getting the footage because, you know, back then people didn't walk around with iPhones and iPads right. and take video. So um, that's been our biggest challenge, but we're doing, we're, we're doing our best to, to get as much footage as we can, um, not only from fans but from the artists. We are also, we've interviewed um, a lot of the club owners, the Greco brothers who own the Malibu nightclub and own Spit, and some of the other club owners who... Um, are trying to gather some footage from some of the concerts because, as you know, like U2 played their uh, one of their first concerts in a small venue at the Malibu nightclub, and that was a huge event and a huge, a huge event for Long Island and a huge event for LIR. We're, we're getting our, our hands on as much um, nostalgic material, material as we can to really set the stage and the mood for being back at that time period, so people can really reflect and remember and enjoy it. You know, before we get into where people can go and learn about the movie and the Facebook page and all of that, I have to ask you if you think that a situation like WLIR could happen again, not necessarily with the same style of music, because obviously music has changed so much, it doesn't even resemble what it used to be, 
But do you think that sort of station with the state of radio today, do you think that could happen again? Or is this something that strictly resides in the past? That's very interesting that you're asking me that because on a lot of our interviews with people, we ask that question to them. Right. <laughs> so that has been a very popular question. I won't say what other people have said. I'll just say my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's unfortunate the way radio has gone um, with, you know, some, I'm not going to mention any names, but some of the big corporations that have taken over. I don't know if we can capture that DJ fan relationship the way it was back then, because the reality is, is that that was our social network back then. Yep, we didn't have right. computers. Yep. We didn't have Facebook. We relied on listening to the radio to find out where to go on a Friday night to dance and listen to the music of LAR or what was happening or um, even advertisements. And, you know, they had the best commercials on LAR, if you remember. They were really funny and creative and they worked. But mostly it was, you know, being able to call up and we had an airline at LAR. So people were able to call up not only to request the song, but to talk about things, ask about the weather report. I mean, there were a lot of different conversations that went on between DJs and fans, and it became like a family. And I don't know if we can capture that same essence the way radio is today. Um, if we had a station similar to that with that kind of concept, then maybe with new music that's coming out now. Uh, in Los Angeles, we have a public station called KCRW, where they do try to um, generate new bands and, and obscure bands and bands that nobody has ever heard of, but it's not the same vibe. It's just, it's just different. The date has been set for WLIR's non-conformal ball, the fashion and music event of the 80s. Don't come up here dressed up like that anymore. What's the matter with you? You want me to go crazy? With... And lots of... Surprises, surprises, surprises. The non-conformal ball, April 2nd at the Ritz in Manhattan. Doors open at 9.30 p.m. and you must be 16 to get in and 21 and over to drink. Wednesday, April 2nd at the Ritz in Manhattan. WLIR's non-conformal ball, the fashion and music event of the 80s. From the station that dares to be different, WLIR-FM, Garden City. The only place to be on your dial, your FM dial, the best spot on the dial. The only station I'd ever work for. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Larry the Duck with Barry Ravioli. I must say, it is a pleasure to work with you, Barry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. I'm having a good old time here. It's 8.55, five minutes away from 9 o'clock. By the way, in one hour... Barry will be sitting in for the vacationing Bob Baroni. Ah, yes. And he will have a prize that dares to be different. A getaway weekend for two. Cozy two in a bathtub in the Poconos. <laughs> in a bathtub in the Poconos? Well, heart-shaped bathtub, at least. So that's coming up at 10 o'clock this morning. W no one told me about the bathtub. Well, it's a secret. Oh, okay. We'll talk about it then. In a landmark decision, the Supreme Court has announced that LIR 92.7, Larry the Duck, and Barry Ravioli have been banned in 49 states. Oh. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head with the social networking comparison because, you know, I suppose in a way, you know, Facebook is your big WLIR in much the same way that uh, YouTube is your MTV. Right. You know, we sit and we, we might pine for these things, but the reality is they've kind of been replaced by different technology. And radio, exactly. radio sort of, you know, radio exists, commercial radio anyway, exists to do something other than what it used to do. Now it exists to be boring, I guess. I don't, <laughs> I don't know exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the freedom, and that's one of the things that we talk about that's the real heart of the movie is, you know, the freedom that these people were given by Elton, the DJs, to be able to play the music that they played. I don't think history would have been made if it wasn't for Elton and for the freedom and ability for them to go and connect with these um, indie labels and um, import companies, import record companies that were throwing records at them. Here, play this, play this, even before the labels were allowing them to play them. I mean, they were playing B-sides and stuff, and they made the records famous before the labels gave the permission, and right. they pissed the record labels off. Um, they went against the grain, and they took risks. They dared to be different. That's why they were the station that dared to be different, and that's what the movie's all about, Dare to be Different, is because nobody else would do this. And they really risked a lot, but you know what? It paid off 
and that's why we're documenting this, to show the world what the station did and how they changed history. They really did. And every single artist that I've interviewed really had no problem at all arranging their schedules so that they can be interviewed and pay homage to the station because they were so proud of the station and what they did for their careers. And um, so we're excited to continue this process and interview some of these other artists that um, are waiting to set up, you know, uh, dates, right. interview dates. And, yeah, it's, it's going to be fantastic. So, so. Your, your timetable is maybe the end of the year, hopefully having it wrapped up? Our goal is to hit next year's film festival. Okay. So we have quite a few that we uh, have in mind. There's a couple of documentary film festivals that we're going to um, apply to, as well as some of the bigger film festivals. One of them, of course, being Tribeca, which is in New York, sure. which would be very appropriate. Um, South by Southwest, which does a lot of music documentaries, yeah. and we're hoping to get into Sundance as well. So those are the big three here in the States. And then um, there's Hot Docs over in Canada, and there's Silver Docs in Washington. And um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a great journey, and we'll see we'll see how it goes. <laughs> So, so far, so good, though. Yeah, it sounds it. Uh, so w- when people want to find out about Dare to be Different, the movie, where do they go online? Okay, so we're on Twitter. So you would Twitter us at Dare to be Different, the movie. And then we're also on Facebook. So we have a Facebook page called Dare to be Different, the movie. And I think it's safe to say, and I think you would support this idea, that anyone listening in the broadcast radius of this radio station, WFDU, which covered a lot of the same territory that... Uh, uh, LIR did, and you listened to LIR back in the early 80s, and you maybe have some photos or some footage or whatever, I think it would be a good idea to get in touch with you. Yes, and, and they can they can do that on Facebook. We have some people manning the Facebook page, or they can write me directly um, at Ellen Goldfarb at dtbdthemovie.com, um, or you can send it to our general email, which is info at dtbdthemovie.com. All right. Well, thanks so much, Ellen. It's been great talking to you. All I can say to wrap this up is uh, get back to work. I want to see this movie. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ghosty. We'll definitely be in touch and let you know when it's, when it's out and ready to be seen. So thank you so much for interviewing me.